if you have your copy of the scriptures and would like to read along for our scripture passage this morning, you'll want to find Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3 in your Bibles, and we'll pick up in verse 16, which is precisely where we left off last week, and we will read all the way down through verse 11 of chapter 4. Now, I want you to Be reminded as we step off into these words this morning that this is the continuation of a warning that was extended by the writer of the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, to warn the the believers of the importance of perseverance in our faith. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what that perseverance really is about and, and what we hope to gain by continuing in consistency in our fellowship of the Lord Jesus So beginning in verse 16 of chapter 3, For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter into his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world." For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts." For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience." I don't know if you remember or not. I know that it's been two or three weeks ago. But we actually talked about a passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 2 where it speaks about the clouds being rolled up like a a scroll, the heavens being rolled up like a scroll. And so we we think about that song and we think about those words and we're not just trying to create some concept of something that may or may not happen at some point in time. We're actually dealing with something that is going to ultimately be a reality. One day, one day... The Lord is going to descend with a shout, and He's going to call His people to Himself, and we're going to have the opportunity to either spend eternity with Him or separate from Him from that point forward. And uh, my prayer, my hope is that whenever that day comes, that whenever that day happens, that if we're still alive and remain, or if we've already passed from this life, that my hope is that I would see every one of you on that day with Jesus. That's, that's what we're all about. That's what's important. That's the only and the most important thing that we'll ever discuss or ever deal with in our lives. Am I ready for that day? Because that day will come. And we've been reminded of that vividly in the last week in a couple of different instances of how we just don't know what a day is going to bring. But we know that God has given us this day. And so today we assemble before Him in His presence and before His Word trusting that he'll speak to us, asking him to do so. And here we are, of all places and all times, at Labor Day weekend. We just got through celebrating the first day of January, a minute ago. This this year is flying by. Labor Day is a holiday. It's a holiday that that actually, and you can read about this on the internet as easy as I did, that actually grew out of several violent clashes between the Labor Party and police back during what is called the Haymarket Riot in 1886. And during that time, thousands of workers in Chicago took to the streets, and their goal? They demanded an eight-hour workday. 
Before that, they were able to be worked as long as they could be worked. They were really demanding one thing. Do you know what they were asking for? Rest. They said, we need some rest. We need some rest. You know, in Romans chapter 8, the Bible describes creation. When it comes closer and closer to the winding down of everything as being like a mother about to give birth, in, and it says in labor. And it's like the world is in labor, and it's just grinding. And, and I don't know if you feel the impact of that in your life. I don't know how you, how you feel about walking through the world these days, but, but sometimes it just is a draining experience. It takes it all out of you. Sometimes it leaves you depleted and spiritually exhausted where you're saying, I just don't know how to put another spiritual foot in front of the other. And sometimes we find ourselves reinvigorated. We find ourselves rejoicing in the great things that God is doing. But in this passage, what's happening is that the writer is writing to a group of people who have really been strained and drained in their faith walk and in their confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're actually just kind of thinking, well, maybe it's time for me just to choose the sideline. Maybe it's time for me just to, to step out of the, the, the spotlight of strong faith and just, just be sort of a quiet Christian, if at all. Now, maybe it's time for me not to be recognizable or identifiable as someone who's a follower of this person, Jesus Christ. And so the author is writing this to help them understand that really that's not much of an option if you want to ensure yourself of the goal and of the prize that God has established for those who, who believe in God and trust in God and live by faith. And he says, in fact, there's, there's something that God has prepared and planned for those, but the way to get there is only through faith in, in Jesus Christ. And that, that there that he's talking about is identified and, and described by this descriptor in this chapter. It's the word rest. So he speaks about rest, and he says there's a rest. He says there remains a rest for the people of God. And doesn't that encourage you? And, and he says that time is never meant to happen at 11.15 on Sunday morning in the church house. That is not the place where that rest is supposed to take place. So everybody wake on up. I know it's holiday weekend, so wake on up, and we're going to try to engage in God's Word. So what happens here is that we see that this passage is speaking about the, it's sort of a mixture, if you will, of these people who are saying, well, I had this confession of faith, but I want to step apart from it. I'm tired of the pressure and the, 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 the persecution that it's bringing into my life, and so I just want to kind of crawl off into a hole and, and let that be what was once a part of my life, and I'm just going to go back to worshiping the way that I did when I worshiped with, with the, the, in, in the Jewish tradition, and, and that way I won't have all this pressure and all this trouble. And the writer says, no, 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 you, you can't do that and expect to enter into and experience what is called the rest of God. And so he says, if you really want to enter the rest of God, it requires what I would call and what I've termed here an authentic faith. So he says that an authentic faith response to the gospel is what's required, and that is indicated by perseverance on the part of those who are claiming to have this connection, this relationship with Jesus Christ. And in this passage, he describes those who have that relationship as partakers of Christ. So he says, if you can't, you can't claim to be a partaker of Christ and sideline yourself from persevering in that confession of faith that you have made. So when he talks about perseverance, what's he talking about? Well, when we talk about you need to persevere and, and, and that that's an indicator of an authentic faith, what does that mean? What does perseverance look like? Very simple personal definition. Perseverance in this case really is, is identified or described in these words. It's continuing belief that is marked by a, a constancy of obedience that grows out of trust in the one that you're following. It is a continuing belief that is marked by ongoing obedience that grows out of trust in the one that you're following. In other words, it's a, a belief in Jesus that, that leads you to, to walk in obedience to what God lays out in front of you because you trust that God's way is the right way and the best way for your life. So, as he speaks about that, he says that, it, that your authentic faith response 
bears the marks of perseverance within it. So why is perseverance so important? Why is this a necessary thing? Well, he tells us in this passage that, that, that it is part of the goal for the persevering believer is to enter into God's rest. So, so I guess we need to understand God's rest, right? That's, that's going to be the, the key to the day is understanding God's rest. And in this passage, there are three different elements, three different aspects of God's rest, three different types, if you will, three different explanations of the rest that's spoken about. And so he uses one of these, or a couple of these actually, to, to, decide, to help you decide what God's rest is not. And so it's important to know that. So he begins by talking about what I would call creation rest. And, and we, we understand that from the Ten Commandments as Sabbath rest. Now let's look, let's look at the passage and see what it says. Let's begin in verse 3. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. The works were finished. Okay, So this is, this is, this is going to go back and talk about some of the things related to our very own faith. But look in verse 4. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Now, here, here's a couple of aspects of that. Obviously, this is speaking about creation, right? This is speaking about the six days of creation, whenever God spoke everything into existence, and, and, he, and, and after he did all of that, he created all the animals, all the luminaries, all the, the earth, and everything that we know that exists. And, and at the end of all that, even after he created humanity, he says, it is good. And what God means by it is good is not... Not, not that it's just, it's just some splendid example, but that it's a completed work. He's saying that this is a completed work. I have finished the work that I came here, to, that, I, that I set out to do in creation. So I'm stepping back and saying, there's nothing else to be done. But now in this place, he also mentions another rest, that is, and, and he says about this, this rest and, and, the, and the completion of these works, that they were completed before the foundation of the world. Now, if you read that phrase, foundation of the world, in another place, you'll see the Scripture talks about Jesus Christ being the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So there's not only this work of creation that is present and, and, and that God rested from because it was a completed work, but there's another work that took place before the foundation of the world, and that is the work of God in bringing to us the opportunity to be saved. So you have this creation rest. It speaks to the rest of God after creation. Not that God co completed his creative work in the universe and withdrew to a place of peace and inactivity, but rather the implication is that God looked at his completed work and it met his divine approval, God's rest. And, and, and so it, it, just, it just is divine satisfaction that is stamped across that creation. So it's a finished product that is just as it should be. That's what he's saying about the creation rest. But then he speaks about another different kind of rest here. If you go back up to verse 16 of chapter 3, he talks about the Israelites again. He keeps bringing them up. And he says about them that, that and he asks a series of questions. And, and the series of questions speaks about the inability, the failure of some to enter the rest. But then in chapter 8, he says something very interesting. He says, if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. So when he speaks about the rest that the people of old did not enter into the people who fell in the wilderness, we'll just call that Canaan rest, the rest of the Canaan land, the promised land rest. So there's a second aspect of rest that he's speaking about here, and this is what God had designed and prepared for the people who would follow him by faith, who would trust him and let him lead them into this gift of the promised land that he had prepared for them and that he was trying to prepare them for. And so you have, you have this Canaan rest. And this is really uh, kind of typological. It's kind of symbolic. It's, it's, it, it, it looks like the, the rest that you and I experience whenever we listen to the words of Jesus when he said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And, and then, then you go back to that section where he says that there was a lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. It is through Jesus that we experience the rest and the peace in our souls that comes with knowing that our sins are forgiven whenever we place our trust 
in Him. When we confess our faith in the Lord Jesus, when we become a partaker of Christ, there's an element, an aspect of rest that we experience because we're not trusting any longer in our goodness to make us right in the sight of God, but we're trusting in what God has done through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the works that were completed before the foundation of the world. And so we're believing on Jesus. We're placing our faith in Him. We're trusting in Him. And, and, and so Canaan rest looks a lot like the, the life that we begin to live on this earth as, as we've accepted and trusted and placed our faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus. And, and yes, we, we are moving through this with this, this settledness in our souls that, our, 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 that we're right with God in eternity, that our sins are forgiven, and that we've, we've been given the peace of God that passes understanding, and we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And so we have these things, these realities, that generate a rest within us. But just like the people who had the promised land in front of them, they still had stuff to do while they were here in this life. They still had service to render. They still had work to do. They still had a life of obedience to live before the Lord. And, and so whenever it says, if, if this would have been the only rest that God wanted for the people, then Joshua wouldn't have said, yeah, wait, 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 there's another day of rest still coming. And so we have this, this creation rest, which is the Sabbath rest, which is the rest of God that says everything's fine, everything's good, everything, I'm satisfied with the way everything is. Then we have our lives where God, is, Jesus basically tells us that as he works, the Father also works. So he hasn't just ceased from everything, but he ceased from that creation. And now he's working in us about transformation. He's working in us to conform us to the image of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's recreating us to be like Jesus. And, and that's a process that's called sanctification. Let me tell you about sanctification. Sanctification will never be completed here. Okay? We're striving. We're, we're investing. We're walking and, and, and we're pursuing and we're following but we have by no means arrived. We are all on the road. And some of us find ourselves at different places. Some of us walking along just happy-go-lucky as we can be. And we didn't see that stone that was in the middle of the road. While we were looking up at the birds in the clouds and we stumbled. And some of us even fell. Because we're on the road. But God works in our lives to affect this process of hopefully conforming us more and more day by day into the image of His Son, Jesus. So, so we think about this, this promised land rest, this Canaan rest, and, and, and it reminds us that just like the children of Israel had to go in and conquer the land and settle the land and divide up the land and work the land, we're here now. That's what we're doing now. We're living in that reality, the reality that would be similar to the rest of Canaan for the people of old. But we know that this isn't the end of that rest. This is just an aspect of it. We have rest in our souls because we, we have faith in Christ, but there's also a different, a, th a third kind of rest that's mentioned here. And if you look down in verse 9 where he says, there remains a rest for the people of God. And then you can look in Revelation and, and, and you can see there where it says, they who have died have entered their rest. So this is not talking about creation rest. This is not talking about Canaan rest. This is talking about celestial rest. It's talking about the rest that we will experience whenever we are complete and finished on this journey. We've, we've walked every step. We've come to the divide. We've stepped over, and we're into that reality, that realm that God has prepared for all of those who love Him. So you have the, the celestial rest, which is really the, the rest of heaven. It's that eternal and final and ultimate rest when our sanctification will ultimately then be complete. And, and he says that this is a rest that is promised. It still exists in the sphere of promise. It's not completed yet and won't be in our lives as long as we walk this phase of the journey. But it's fully available to us. We're invited and encouraged throughout Scripture to pursue that rest of God that, that, that we experience in fullness at the conclusion of this phase, this step, this part of our journey. And so we pursue. We pursue with trust and faith and 
desire to win the prize. <laughs> and, and as I said, Monday morning at the memorial service of one of our friends, reward from God and our desire for it is not a selfish ambition. It is actually a scriptural motivation. We're motivated from Scripture to run as one who wants to win the prize. And the one who wants to win the prize runs hopefully without balking, without faltering, without stopping, without turning aside, without changing directions, without relaxing their grip and their intensity. And so we pursue, we, we, we seek to persevere. And what if we don't? What if we don't? Well, we see, secondly, in this passage, that would be after the fifth part of the first thing, we see a reminder of the importance of this active faith. And we begin by seeing that as we take a look at what I would call the consequences of rebellious unbelief. Now, remember, perseverance is, is this continuing belief, this continuing faith. And in, in these verses, verses 16 through 18, he, he, lists, he gives us this series of questions that identify those who could not enter God's rest. He begins by describing them as those who rebelled, those who looked at the ways of God and said, I'll have none of that. Those who had heard the voice of God, those who had, had known of God's message to them through the, the, the servant of God, Moses. And yet they said, we will not follow. We will not walk in this way. We refuse. We reject this. We rebel against this. And then there were those who followed Moses. There were those who fought. Who was it? They were those who followed Moses out of Egypt. So th this was, these were the ones who, who Moses gathered up under God's leadership and with God's strength and power and led out of that land out into the wilderness, those who followed Moses. But then he said they were also those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness. So these were those who didn't have the opportunity because of unbelief, he says, to, to follow God into this Canaan rest that he had for them. And so he says they were forbidden to enter his rest because they did not obey. So here you have the, the first phrase, the first indicator of why they couldn't experience this. He says they did not obey. They rebelled, they did not obey, and then, then he says they, they could not enter in because of unbelief. So you have rebel, disobey, unbelief. All these things are characteristic of the faith that doesn't persevere, which brings that faith into question. So he says that they were prevented by unbelief. And what the idea here is this, that God has stood before them and demonstrated his faithfulness and his love and his care and his willingness to take them into that land. And they looked at what God said and they said, no, we don't want to follow you. We want to go our own way. And so by, because of their choices, they denied themselves the opportunity to enter into God's rest. So disobedience becomes here evidence of unbelief. And the consequences were they could not enter into God's rest. Now, if you look in verse 1, the writer is writing now to the Hebrews, the believers, and he's saying this, those who've confessed their faith, he says, Therefore, let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of it. He says, you, you, need to, you need to be sure that you're holding the ball tightly, that you're gripping strongly, that you're holding the confession of your faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, he says, you're setting yourself up in a similar category as these who were disallowed from entering into the rest of God. The celestial rest, the Canaan rest. So, there are consequences for rebellious unbelief. And he mentions it throughout this passage, but then he also tells us that we need to anticipate the conclusion of persevering faith. Verse 1, he says that there remains a promise of entering his rest. So we have this promise from God. Verse number three, he says, we who have believed do enter that rest. That rest is there for us. He's, in verse number eight, he says, Joshua speaks of another day where the rest of God will become opportunity and reality for us. In verse number nine, he says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. So all these things are present. Verse number 10, he says, those who have entered his rest, he who has entered his rest has himself ceased from his works. 
as God did from his. So, so the cessation of labor is, is part of the conclusion of this persevering faith. The cessation of labor. Rest from his works. We stand on this side of the curtain, if you will, that, that does not give us clear access into everything that God has prepared for those who love Him. And there's a reason for that. The reason is because here we must learn to walk by faith, trusting the one who's called us to Himself through the redemptive work of His Son Jesus on the cross. So we, we trust, we believe, we obey because of what Jesus has done and because of what He's promised and what He's provided redemptively and futuristically, eternally. And so, so the conclusion of persevering faith is this opportunity to experience forever whatever the fullness of God's rest looks like. Sanctification, glorification, fellowship in the presence of the Lord forever, perfection, purity, joy, unspeakable. So, Verse number 11, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Let us be diligent to enter that rest. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience as those mentioned up in the last part of chapter 3. So here we are. We need to realize that rest is a reality for the person of persistent pursuit of partaking in Christ. We are partakers of Christ, but we must pursue that persistently. We, we can't accessorize Jesus in our lives. He has to be the center. He has to be our all in all. We have to diligently pursue Him. Why is that important? Why should we even think about that? Two reasons. First of all, Christ alone has procured and secured a perfect salvation. Only Jesus can save from our sin. Only Jesus can cause our sins to be just absolutely washed away, completely forgiven, clean, pure in the sight of God through the shed blood of Jesus. Now, you may disagree. that You may say that's extreme, that's extreme that it takes something like that to make me right with God. I'm sorry about that, but that's what God has said and that's what God has done. And He's done that because He loves us with an everlasting love and He wanted to provide for us a way, a way to receive that forgiveness and that grace and that mercy and to be considered right in the sight of God where we didn't have to pay that penalty. We didn't have to bear that, that cost. Christ has done it. Christ has done it. So quit Quit rest from your works of trying to make yourself right in the sight of God and just come to Jesus. Rest in Jesus. You can't earn forgiveness. You can't earn salvation. So quit trying and just rest in Him. Place your trust and your faith in Christ. Second reason that it's worth pursuing. Because Christ has promised eternal rest for the believer who perseveres. Now again, I can't, I can't stand up here and tell you everything that looks like or what all it entails or involves, but I can tell you that it's got to be good. I mean, I think about the word rest, and I'm like, man, that sounds so desirable. That sounds so inviting. But he talks about an eternal, a celestial rest for the believer who perseveres. So my encouragement to us this morning is to keep believing. Keep pursuing faithfulness. Keep being obedient. Practice consistency. Hang in there. Stay true to the Lord Jesus because He has been true to you. I ask you to bow your heads, please. Maybe you're here this morning and you've done everything that you know to do to try to find the peace, the rest in your soul, in your spirit that has been so elusive, so difficult to, 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 to discover. And, and today these words sound very inviting to you. 
the rest of God. God's rest. Come unto me, Jesus said. I'll give you rest. Do you need rest in your soul this morning? Just just begin to, to, to speak to the Lord Jesus where you are. Just ask him to become personally present, interactive with you through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Ask him to begin to speak words of rest to you. Ask him to receive you in, in humility and to forgive you for your sins. Just ask him to do those things. He wants to do it. He loves you so much. He, he wants your life to be living in that state, that condition that, that he calls rest here, the, the rest of Canaan, if you will, where we live and we serve, but we have this peace in our heart that passes understanding. Come to Jesus today. Maybe you're here as a believer and you've, you've stepped back from your commitment to Christ. You've stepped back from your confession of faith. You, you've decided that the parameters that God has set for us in His Word are not applicable for your life, but today you hear and you know and there's an unrest in your soul. There's a, there's a need, there's a longing, there's a desire for things to be, to be at peace between you and God. Repentance is the word. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he stands ready, he waits, he longs to wrap his arms around you and support and encouragement and, and to, to renew you, to restore you. Just ask him to. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And after that, I'm going to ask you to go ahead right now before I pray and stand to your feet. And as I pray, we'll just hear some music afterwards and give you an opportunity if you need one of our ministers to meet with you and to pray with you and to share with you, encourage you or even give you information about how to receive Christ or how to, how to get your life back on track or how to become a member of this fellowship. Whatever it may be, this, this may be the time for you to just step up and step forward. So you come. We're, we're here and we will greet you warmly and We'll do everything we can to help you. Father, we thank you today for your rest, the promise of your rest, eternal rest. We thank you for the rest that we can have in our own souls right now by placing our faith in Jesus and living uh, this, this authentic faith before you where we seek to persevere and we strive to live in trusting obedience to you. Oh, God, grant peace to every person here today through obedience and trust. In Jesus, in his name we pray. You come as we wait. You come. Our men are here. We're ready to receive you. We're ready to receive you now. Some time back, we began to talk to a lady who was going to help in the preschool area of our uh, children's ministry and do some things related to Mother's Day out and so forth. And her name is Shannon Rosas. I introduced her to you here in just a few weeks back. But she's been working around here for a number of weeks. And let me tell you about Shannon just real quickly. Uh, she she never has skipped a beat. She There was not really a, a what I would call a, a large uh, time frame of her getting her feet wet. She jumped right in and began to work. And she's been busy, busy, busy. Uh, she's, she's a hard worker. She loves the children. And more than anything, she loves the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we believe that God has worked ahead of us to bring her to us, knowing before she ever came here that Melinda was going to be stepping aside. And so we believe that God has just given us a gift of, of Shannon Rosas as our new director of children's ministries. And so would you join me in welcoming her? to say thank you so much. Um, you guys have been awesome church family to come into, just so warm and welcoming. Thank you. And I just praise God for how he's led me to this moment. I try not to cry. Um, it's just been a really cool story of just, I caught glimpses of the service today as I was working with the kids, but trusting God and just walking and letting go of my plans for my life and saying, God, whatever it is that you have for me, that's what I want to do. And I've just been trying to stay faithful to that. And God has definitely been faithful to me and my family. 
so I'm super excited about coming in as the children's director, and I can't wait to see what God has in store, and I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much.